Mr. President, it is my pleasure to announce the presence in the chamber of Brigadier General Hal Dane Lamberton, our Adjutant General of Kentucky. Ten seconds. Ladies and gentlemen, Brigadier General Lamberton is 53rd Adjutant General of Kentucky. Um, his current, he, he was sworn in by the governor on the 10th day of December 2019. You've heard one by all, you've heard them all. Just to change the names and the dates. But uh, uh, Colonel Carpenter, I appreciate the opportunity to get up and address and share a couple of thoughts with you all. Uh, I really appreciate doing so right after everybody stuffed themselves for lunch and, and if I see any heads nodding, well that's on you but I'll note it. Travis, we may have to talk about the, the timing of that for future get-togethers. You know, I, I do have some comments that I wanted to, to share with you all, but prior to, to doing so for having listened to General Robinson and his comments as our Nogus president, just one thing struck me in particular, his, and, and let me say, I respect General Robinson, I respect what he does, because everything he does is on our behalf, and he certainly is an advocate for not just the National Guard, but all 54, because, you know, a lot of us make the joke, 54 states and territories, I say 54 fiefdoms, because it's different for every state and territory that you go to, but his comments of our primary mission being the primary combat reserve. As I heard that and just thought it through a little bit more, my, uh, my overriding thought was we ain't the, the primary combat reserve to anybody. I think of you guys out of the air wing and specifically with the STS or the Special Tactics Squadron, when your folks were over there in Afghanistan and literally fighting right next to the, to the Rangers, to the SEALs, to the SF guys, you weren't a reserve to anybody. When, let's see, where are my 206 engineers? Okay. When your battalion was deployed and you had Iranian missiles that were raining in on you, you weren't, I'm filtering my language a little bit, the reserve to anybody. You know, I, I think what we do in the Guard these days, and again, I'm proud to, to be a Guardsman, and for the, the quality of the folks that we've got across our entire formation, in particular here in Kentucky, but I, I think of the, uh, the 2ID, the 2nd Infantry Division model of second to none. We ain't anybody's combat reserve. We're another component to the Army. We're another component to the Air Force. But we aren't second to anybody. Cool? cool. That said, now what I did want to go over with, with everybody this afternoon now, you know, the last 18 months sure as heck weren't the, uh, the 18 months that I think any of us anticipated. Uh, prior to that, you know, I couldn't have spelt coronavirus, let alone know what it was, let alone know what impact it would have on us. But, you know, over the last 18 months, for your alls, for our engagement in response to it, you know, at the, the high end, we had just a, about a, a thousand soldiers and airmen responding to some aspect of the pandemic support. You know, everything, and some of you all, or certainly some of the folks that, that you all serve with, we still have out there serving in hospitals across the, the state right now. And, and our folks are serving there, if you aren't already tracking, because hospital staffs have been diminished, uh, either because of their folks contracting the virus, or because of issues of uh, vaccination mandates and staff members not wanting to get vaccinated and walking away from their jobs. Bottom line, there's a need for our folks to augment these hospitals. 
and that the hospitals were in, if you didn't have any sense of the number of it, we, the Kentucky National Guard, are currently represented in about a third of all of the hospitals across the entire Commonwealth at this junction. But there's not only the, the hospital representation, we still have folks who are actively engaged with the, the MVTs, or what we call the, the mobile vaccination teams. We've had soldiers and airmen who are involved with the drive-through test sites. We had soldiers and airmen who are involved with setting up a statewide patient transportation system. We've had soldiers and airmen who have augmented the Department of Public Health and have effectively run their operations center, let alone our own operations center. We've had soldiers and airmen who have done everything from responding to civil disturbance issues up in Louisville, let alone other civil disturbance issues that lasted a few months up in D.C. We've had soldiers and airmen who, for the first time to my awareness, were involved in the state's primary election process. That's not only first, I believe, for the, uh, the State Guard, but I think it's a first nationally. The military quite simply has been precluded from perceived negativity for having somebody in uniform present during those dynamics. So it sure as heck is unique not only to the country, but especially to the, the Kentucky Guard in particular. So, you know, that I think, and I've joked with some of you that I consider one of the, uh, the roles I've got is that of being a, a CMO or a chief marketing officer for the Guard. Because you get away from gatherings like this and you get away from folks who've been any part of the, the military, you know, for the, the communities that we live in. Very few folks really fully understand what the, the Guard does or the extent of our involvement. For the most part, a lot of folks will just simply think, oh, if you've got a, a flood or, or the aftermath of a, a tornado, uh, the guard's going to go out and fill sandbags. Well, I, I say but we do a little bit more than just fill sandbags in event of a flood because, oh, by the way, at the same time, we had all these things, these pandemic support activities going on. We had, where are my uh, 206 engineers again? Our 206 soldiers, as I previously mentioned, were in Western Iraq and Syria when Iranian missiles rained in on them. You know, fortunately, nobody was physically hurt, but of my understanding, there were quite a few concussions and, and perhaps lingering still with that going on. Let's see, do, do I have anybody here from the, uh, the 1163rd? Okay, they're out doing medical things, so I'll stick with that one. Our medical company, and I, I know that a number of you all are tracking this, but they spent a year in Poland, part of what's known as Operation Atlantic Resolve. That is NATO, but with a, a U.S. lead operation to stem the, the Russian intrusion into the Ukraine. Guardsmen involved at a, a strategic level for that type of a, a dynamic. At the, the same time, that was going on. We've had 200 plus guardsmen on the, the southwest border. Some of you are, are probably tracking that just yesterday we mobilized another 200 plus guardsmen to get ready to go down to the southwest border. Oh, by the way, it's, do I have any infantrymen here? Okay, they're out doing infantry things. <laughs> Our infantry our infantry battalion, if you aren't tracking this at the moment, but a portion of them, almost 200 soldiers, are currently gearing up to head over to Kosovo for a year-long security mission. And then just a, a couple of months after that, we've got a, another group of about 200 infantrymen who are heading over to the Horn of Africa for another security mission. You know, being into the Guard, and especially the Kentucky Guard these days, sure as heck ain't about putting together sandbags in a flood. And so for what you've done, what we've done, what all of the folks in the Kentucky Garden 
and some of you heard me say this before, I'll say it again, so it'll be out there, but I'm biased to the Kentucky Guard, and it's because of you all, it's because of the quality of the folks, it's because of the, the quality of the, the response for what your units have done, not just in the past 18 months, but in the, the year preceding that as well. The, uh, let's see, do, do we have any SCS members present today? Okay, I'll, I'm going to talk bad about them then. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not, but the one thing I, I wanted to bring out, I know for all of the folks involved with uh, the 123rd, you're tracking this, and I know some of my Army brothers and sisters are tracking this as well, but in the, the bigger Air Force, over the, the last 20 years, the, the Air Force has recognized nine of its airmen with the Air Force Cross. The, the Air Force Cross, for, for you Army guys who aren't familiar with it, it's the equivalent to the DSC or the Distinguished Service Cross for the Army. You know, it's second to the, the Medal of Honor as far as where it stands in the recognition of heroism in a combative environment. Of those nine Air Force Crosses, two of those nine went to the folks in our STS. Our, our little, uh, what is it, 1,100-member uh, Air Wing and the, the smaller STS have a, a significant proportion of the, the highest award that the Air Force has to recognize its folks with. And, and I use that just as a, uh, a distinction for the, the quality of the folks, not just in the STS, but again, across the entire organization at, at this junction. You know, for most of us, when I first became a, a Guardsman back in 97, so yeah, I know that, that some of you have more time into the Guard than I do. Uh, but, but Chief, I'm still more experienced than you, is what I counter that with. And, and when I say experience these days, I don't use the word uh, or the, the term older any longer. I just say I'm more experienced. Uh, so, so that's my way of quibbling around it. But in the past 20 years, and some of you all have been a part of this, we've had almost 19,000 individual soldiers and airmen deploy. You know, you figure that out and you do the, the numbers against the, the people we have in uniform today, well, we have roughly about 7,800 folks between the Army and the Air Guard. So you do the, the math that tells you right away we've had folks who've deployed multiple times. And by virtue of all of those deployments, and obviously for some of the situations that, that I just shared with you, they sure as heck aren't risk-free and some of our uh, uh, fellow guardsmen have made the, the ultimate sacrifice as a result of it. But I would also counter that where we as an organization, both the blue component to the green component, have benefited from that. You know, in my time as a, a guardsman, I'd say that we are a far more professional, far more proficient, far more, if you will, prideful organization than what I first knew. And for, for those of you who are more experienced than I, but what I'd say is that you all laid the foundation for what we are in the Kentucky National Guard today. So to, to that aspect, if you will, just give me a hand for our retirees for a moment. But, but again, as I mentioned, the, 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 the pride, the professionalism, the proficiency, the, the expertise that we are in our unit formations from the 149 to the 123rd to everybody out here, we are a quality organization that quite simply I'm proud to be a member of and to serve with each one of you all these days. You know, the, uh, as I became to the TAG, one of the things that occurred to me, because I, I do generally believe that it, organizationally we benefited across all of our force structure for, for the quality of individuals that we've got here, for the, the quality of how well our folks, our formations respond, whether it's a dom ops scenario, whether it's a uh, oak and a sniper, but also all of our force structure for, for the quality. My biggest concern, especially in becoming TAG, 
but was I uh, sure as heck didn't want to see our proficiency or professionalism diminish in any way. You know, we benefited by virtue of all the deployments that I just mentioned. And as we no longer have a presence in Afghanistan, as we have a very minimal presence in Iraq, you know, who knows what the, the future is going to bring forward for us. But I think we've gained in credibility and respect, not only in the communities we live, but in the, the bigger picture of our country's DOD, let alone across the world. And one of the coolest comments that, that I'd come across, and this was a couple of times where I deployed as a guardsman, and invariably somebody would come up to me and say something like, I didn't know you were in the guard. And I just thought that, see, I'm filtering my language again. I thought that was cool as heck. Uh, because, you know, quite simply, it didn't matter where you came from, what component you were a part of, it's just how well you do your job. That's what garners respect, not only for the individual, but for the organization and everybody in our formations has garnered that type of respect, my belief is, over the, the past 20 years. So, so, you know, I seek out other opportunities, whether it's the, the prospect of our deploying to the southwest border again, wh whether it's opportunities for some other aspect of supporting the, the pandemic response, let alone any type of uh, OCONUS deployment if it comes up because there's a benefit to our organization by virtue of doing so for increasing the, the quality of the, the men and the women that we've gotten into the guard today, let alone our unit proficiency as well. And, and so a couple of other things that I wanted to, to talk about along those lines of improving our opportunities. And, and some of you certainly were just about all the, the leadership that we've got on both the, the Army and the air side at this junction. That they've heard me speak of it, but I wanted to share it with a, a few more of you. If you haven't, is what I'd call a, a, a Title 10, Title 32 swap. My belief is that, you know, we as a state guard, we're just part of a, a fairly small pyramid. And, in the bigger National Guard picture, in the, the bigger regular Army and regular Air Force, let alone DOD. And so if you only serve, if all of your duty positions, especially if you never deployed before or held a duty position outside of the Kentucky National Guard, it's a very limited perspective of the, the military. So, so when I talk about the, the Title 10 referring to either deployed or or regular Army or regular Air Force types of duty positions. I'm talking about our folks going out to serve in those duty capacities outside the Kentucky National Guard, well, whether it's a position at NGB, a position at the, the Pentagon, or folks go to do something at an air base other than ours, uh, working at the, the Readiness Center up at D.C., folks going to, to work in Cadet Command or HRC or some other capacity there at Knox. Well, what I believe happens when that occurs is that our folks get a bigger picture of the military, that they gain from that experience, that they see things from a, a higher level perspective, they learn by virtue of that experience, they expand both their, their professional and their personal networks, and then they come back to the Kentucky Guard, and we as an organization benefit by virtue of their newly gained experience. Make sense? Okay, I think all the heads nodding then were yes is not that anybody's falling asleep. That's good. The worst case scenario that, that I see in that type of, of dynamic, okay, a person goes off to a, a Title X, um, duty position, whether it's in-state or external to the state, and they decide for whatever reason, hey, hey, I like this job, I like the Title X world, and I want to stay here. Well, we don't receive the, the soldier or the airman back in that case, but we as an organization have then expanded our network. So, so now we can reach out to other components of either the Air Force or the Army, and we have proponents for the Kentucky National Guard who are serving elsewhere in the military. So again, as an organization, we benefited from that perspective. You know, a, a little bit ago, 
Let's see. I, I don't see a, a sign for our Div Arty out there. Do, do we? That's you, Andy? Andy, you, sir. You, <laughs> um, on the, the Army side, I, I'm sure that uh, certainly, well, I know certainly those folks who come from a field artillery background are familiar with it. Perhaps uh, there are other folks in uniform who are not quite so, uh, certainly for the, uh, the Air Guard folks who got into the room. The Div Arty, the Division Artillery, was part of the older structures of Army divisions. And uh, the Div Arty effectively had C2 over all the field artillery units in a division. It also served on a in a staff function at the, the G staff level for the Army Division, but, but then it went away for a while and, and it eventually led to our Fires Brigade nomenclature for a bit with a, a little bit different structure. Well, we've added, re-added, if you will, the, the Div Arty back into our structure. What it does for us is twofold. In the near term, and as we're standing that up right now, it gives us a new unit in the, uh, the Kentucky National Guard, as was mentioned a little bit ago. It gives us 200 new billets, both full-time and part-time, an officer and warrant officer and NCO in the uh, Kentucky National Guard. The, the structure of the Div Arty is a little bit more rank heavy. It's not an entry level type of a, a unit for a, a brand new junior EM field artilleryman. From the, the bigger perspective, it gives us additional billets where we can rotate some of our senior officers, warrants, and NCOs into other duty positions and move back and forth, add to their professional development. But perhaps even more so than that, the 38th Div Arty is tied into the 38th Infantry Division headquartered out of the Indiana National Guard. And so what that does for us, which we barely kind of had it before, but it integrates us with that division headquarters. And so it also gives, especially our field artillery folks, an opportunity to move up to the key leadership positions in the 38th ID G staff and everything from uh, Div Arty related positions. I know by virtue of speaking with their, their CG at this junction, he's open to us having key leaders, everything from the chief of staff to the G3, to other G staff permanent positions because we've now further integrated with that division, which again, from my perspective, that's a huge opportunity for the progression, not just of our field artillery folks, but really kind of across the board with all of our Army ranks. You know, that said, that's focused on the Army side, what I'd share as well, and I know that everybody in our Air Guard is tracking this, but so this goes to my uh, Army brethren and sisters that our Air Guard wing is now a C-130J model wing. And for any of you who weren't tracking that, that there is a significant effort behind that. I'd say a, a significant political effort but behind that as well. But only a handful of National Guard wings and a handful of National Guard states were approved for the, the J models. And so right now I'm looking for Colonel Bancroft, there he is. So I'll joke with him in the, the near term that uh, Bruce, you're the only flight wing commander without an airplane in your formation. <laughs> but uh, as he alluded to that uh, uh, that's going to be fixed in the upcoming weeks, but in the, the near term as we're transitioning from one model to another. But the, the reason I bring that up, and you guys are already tracking it, but for the, the green side as well, from my perspective in particular, it, it keeps our air wing, well, one of just a handful, more viable in the upcoming years, more viable in the upcoming decades as part of the total Air Force structure. And for you guys, and I'm an Army guy saying this, but I'm envious of how well the Air Guard is integrated with the, the total Air Force. You know, from my perspective, whether it's the Air National Guard or the, the regular Air Force or the, the Air Force Reserve, across all three of those components, you work together much more seamlessly than we do on the Army side. We still have a little bit of firewalls between our components on the Army side. So how well uh, those three components are integrated on the Air Force side is 
aspirational from my perspective, and I think it's pretty much due to the, the operational nature of what you get engaged with. But again, our 123rd Air Wing is already looked upon by virtue of the, the upgrade to the C-130J models as a more viable entity in the, the total picture of the, the Air Force's structure, not just near term, but again, moving ahead for not just a few years, but for a few decades at, at this junction. I, I'm gonna wrap this up in just a, a little bit, and if anybody has any uh, questions that they wanna bring up, uh, please feel free to do so. Well, one final comment that, that I did want to make, and I've had our association leadership up here mention it, and Jim Sims, wherever he is, uh, he was elbowing me quite a bit to, to bring it up. You know, talking about membership. And uh, a little while ago, I was joking with General Iacocca that, you know, as I got started as a brand new 2LT there at Fort Bragg, we were strongly encouraged to join the O Club, to join the 82nd Association, to join AUSA. And, and I'm not going to go into the, the rationale that's been brought up here because it's all credible, but to, to me, really, the, the overriding reason, and prior to saying that, uh, I did get an AUSA membership. I got a lifetime AUSA membership. When I sure as heck couldn't bloody afford it, but I got the, the lifetime membership. When I transitioned to the, the National Guard, just with the same mentality, I got a lifetime NAUGUS membership. I got a lifetime NGAKY membership. As I became the, the, the TAG, I got a lifetime INGUS membership. As I became more aware of that organization, I got a lifetime uh, MVET membership. But what I'm getting to behind making those comments is quite simply, to me, it was a means of showing myself, and yeah, this is maybe a little bit of a suck up factor to my leadership, but I was committed to it. You know, I sure as heck had no sense uh, how my career would progress, what I'd be doing, where I'd end up. But, you know, e even back then, still as a, a ROTC cadet at UK, I, I knew that I wanted to be part of the, the military, and that was just simply a means of demonstrating my commitment to, to being a soldier. So, so I ask that of you all, and as you can share it back with your soldiers, either in a directorate or in the, uh, the units that you're from, whether you're a brigade commander, a, uh, a flight a battery, a company commander, please share that, that with your folks. Show me how committed you are. Okay, that's all I've got to say at this junction. But uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, if anybody has any questions, here's your opportunity to shoot it at the, the tag uh, and actually in front of a group where I have to be honest with you. Sir, I'll